We have. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Black Health Trust. We're so happy that you chose to spend this hour with us, and we're looking forward to sharing with you a conversation about a topic that is becoming more and more important every day. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our founder, Dr. Randall Maxson. Thank you very much, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Dr. Ivan Walks and Dr. Jocelyn Hines, my co-moderators. I'm honored today to present a topic uh, that's extremely important and extremely interesting. Uh, and plus it's Sunday, so we have a guest pastor, and he is a reverend. But in addition to being a reverend, he is also a physician, and he also holds a PhD. And I've had the pleasure of talking to him on the phone for about the past two years. Uh, he lives in New Hampshire, and I'm told he lives on an eight-acre lake. And I've been dying to come up there as soon as the spring thaw comes. But Dr. Tony Brown is not only a pastor, but he is also a physician, a graduate of Harvard Medical School. He served in the U.S. Army. Uh, he is the chief medical officer of telehealth holdings. He also is involved in uh, biophysiology, brain physiology. Uh, he also deals with the mental health of uh, people who have had strokes. And he has, in his field of neuropsychiatry, has dealt with healing people who've had strokes and can't talk, which is called aphasia. And I'm also interested in hearing everything this brilliant gentleman has to say, especially on, on Sunday. Amen, amen, Dr. Tony Brown. <laughs> and let the church say amen. Thank you much, Dr. Maxey. Amen. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, gathering today to hear me ramble about the stuff I love talking about. I, I like thinking about thinking and talking about thinking and writing about thinking. So we're going to talk about thinking today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. There we go. That'll be about right. Now I never know. So can you can someone tell me if my face is on at the same time my screen is? I always lose track of what's going on here. We yes, can see your be. screen. Sorry. And then we have a little picture of your face. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So they're both up. Thank you much. All right, so let's get started. Uh, what you're looking at uh, as the very first image for today's talk is obviously a brain. And the previous owner of said brain died in uh, April of 1955, Princeton, New Jersey Hospital. 
And as it turns out, that previous owner died of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, when they did the autopsy, not only did they open up the abdomen to find the resultant uh, blood and the hemorrhage that was the cause of death, but the pathologist that did the autopsy, Dr. Thomas Harvey, also decided to open up the cranium of the deceased. Once he did that, he removed the brain and he proceeded to slice the brain into 240 pieces. He wanted to do some research. Now, his supervisor at Princeton Hospital understood that he was a physician researcher. His supervisor came over and said, wonderful, you've taken the brain out, you've dissected it, play well with others and share the, the tissue. So Dr. Thomas Harvey uh, agreed to, but after uh, several months, the supervisor came back and Dr. Harvey had not shared any of the brain tissue with other researchers. So he was given a warning that he had X number of months to share. And if he did not, he would be fired. X number of months passed. He did not share and he was fired. The day that he packed up his box of belongings and his desk, he also packed up the brain. He considered it his property. He put those 240 pieces into uh, 12 uh, Tupperware containers, put them in an army green duffel bag, put them in the back of his 1956 Buick Skylark and drove to Topeka, Kansas, where he opened up a family practice. He took those pieces of brain and placed them in the waiting room and explained to the patients that they were fruit. He put them in canning fruit jars. So they sat there from around 1956 until Thomas Harvey died in around, he died in April of 2007. And after he died, his wife went down to the basement and realized that there were specimens of brain throughout the basement. Luckily, they were labeled, and she was able to figure out that the previous owner of the brain was one Albert Einstein. She understood that she had possession of something that was really important and she did not want to keep it. So she called the Department of Defense. They came and picked up the brain. Uh, they took it to Maryland and they put it in storage. They took images of it from every possible angle because at that time they believed that the Russians were going to be able to look at a photo of the brain and the smartest man in the world and figure out how to clone a human being from a photo of the brain. So this was top secret clearance stuff. So we rolled forward to about 2009 and I became interested in this brain. As it turns out, the um, Department of Defense decided they wanted to construct an online uh, three-dimensional repository for brain tissue. They had the brain of uh, President Grant, right? Also shot, had the uh, portion of the brain of Abraham Lincoln, portion of the brain of John F. Kennedy. Um, so it turns out that they wanted to do some reconstruction on the internet. And this caught my interest. So I started seeking out funding. Uh, top left-hand corner is Major General Hugh G. Robinson. And um, he was the former aide-de-camp for the President of the United States. You know, that guy who wakes him up in the morning and holds his watch while he kisses babies. So um, he also happened to have been the chairman of the federal, uh, the, board, the federal board reserve the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, um, and he was there for about seven years. So he seemed like, given his interest that I had experienced before, he seemed like a good person 
to contact with regard to brain research. So he and I hit the road. And these are the photos you see. We're, we, we were like Al Gore out with his Mac computer and his PowerPoint, just train stop to train stop and, and, and airport to airport. So we uh, partnered finally with the doctor on the bottom left-hand corner, Shaheen Lakam. Uh, Shaheen was a graduate of um, Technion Institute, the Harvard of Israel, if you will. And he was a um, faculty member at Harvard Medical School at the time, and uh, he was interested. So we all came together around this project that we named the Albert Einstein Brain Repository. The idea was that I was going to reach out to people who had received pieces of this brain during the years uh, 1956 through 2007. Because as it turns out, Dr. Thomas Harvey passed out portions of the brain as birthday presents, as anniversary presents. Remember, I said he chopped them up into 240 pieces, but as it turns out, there were up to 1,500 slices that were created from those pieces. So my job was to reach out and to find out what institutions held them because somehow the army had started disseminating them. Some were in a museum in China. There were 180 slices in the Wellcome Trust Museum in the UK. There were 47 slices uh, in Philadelphia at the Mütter Institute. Uh, and it kept going on and on and on. What I was most interested in was who received the personal slices, right? What were the non-institutional uh, recipients that uh, were receiving parts of Albert Einstein's brain? So I began writing to um, individuals who had attended the funeral and naively thought that they were going to tell me that they did or did not have a portion of his brain. By the way, his eyes were also removed during that autopsy, right? He died of a triple A. You don't need to remove his brain. You don't need to remove his eyes. But his opth ophthalmologist of several years was also present at the autopsy. And um, he took the eyes with him. He um, died in 2009, and they've never been seen again. So that said, uh, going back to the story of the Albert Einstein Brain Repository, once we gathered enough funds to begin the research and begin building this platform for, uh, for three-dimensional representation of his brain, uh, it turns out that the United States government had a lot more money and a lot more people. So it really never got off the ground. I talked to a lot of nice people and I heard a lot of great stories, but at the end of the day, you can't compete with the government, but you know, we had fun trying. So I'm gonna come back to that. So instead, we took a left turn. We established um, the Presidential AIDS Council, which, was to be a collection, or I should say an assimilation of all of the presidential aides in history, right? The, the, the guy that walks one step into the right and carries the nuclear football. And Major General Robinson had been the first black um, aide de camp was his official position. Uh, Reggie Love was the second one. He was the aide de camp to President Obama. And these are the guys you never hear about, right? So what General Robinson wanted to do was to figure out how to redirect the purpose of the Presidential AIDS Council towards something that uh, was still community related. Because when uh, President Johnson came into office, which was where he served first as president, as a uh, aide de camp, when President OBJ came in, uh, they presented a plan, right? It was an administrative promise that they were going to do more for civil rights, for education, for economic justice, and for health care. And when you look in their, their book, what you find is those first three have 20 to 30 pages of a well thought out, laid out plan. Healthcare had a half a page. 
So what General Robinson wanted to do was to pick up where LBJ left off. So what we decided to do is direct um, the PAC, I'll call it from now on, Presidential AIDS Council PAC, was to direct the PAC towards mental health. And we started publishing papers. So the one that you see here is um, a paper that tries to appreciate the relationship between socioeconomics and brain functioning, right? Financial hardship changes your brain. And the idea here was kind of related to my PhD thesis. Uh, the PhD thesis was titled the, the Neuroanatomical Correlate of Poverty. A lot of fancy words for why is it that underserved students in school seem to do worse than the others. And the idea was that when you're, when you're out and about, right, evolutionarily, when you're running from that dinosaur, you go into fight or flight, right? And, and after you outrun the dinosaur, you go into rest and digest. You're just going to sleep and, you know, repair yourself. Well, it, it turns out that when you're in fight or flight and you're running from the dinosaur, you, your brain's telling you, you don't have time to be thinking about the second theory of thermodynamics. You don't have time to be doing mathematics. You don't have time to be thinking about anything but running from the dinosaur. So all of the energy goes to widening up those lungs and opening up those eyes so you don't run into trees and going to the muscles so you can run faster. That's fight or flight. No thinking, just surviving. Well, it turns out that to be in an underserved community, to be in a lower socioeconomic class, you were always in fight or flight, right? Because either the electricity was turned off last night or your parents were going through a rough time or the car broke down because you had a hoopty or a partridge in a pear tree. You were always in fight or flight. So no wonder when you get to school and you finally make it to school and you sit down in your chair and the teacher starts talking, you're still in fight or flight. There's cortisol flowing through your veins and you can't remember a thing because you're in fight or flight. Test time comes, you're making low scores. It's not because of a lack of intellect. It was because of a lack of ability to focus. It was a lack of peace. And so what I wanted to show was a correlation between cortisol levels in students in underserved communities and grades. So the paper that you're looking at here was basically an offshoot of that and because the idea being one of the things that sent them into fight or flight was financial hardship. It will change your brain. Relationships. I love this photo. Um, this is a mommy and her baby. So as it turns out that if you wanna be happy in life, the key is relationships. It's not money. It's not resources. It's not living in Florida. It's wherever you are having healthy, long-term relationships, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So at the PAC, we started concentrating on biopsychosocial. Biopsychosocial. The idea is that mental health deals with the biology of the body, the psychology of the mind, and sociology, your relationship with other people. So what I want to talk about today with regard to brain health is we're going to focus on two hormones, two hormones that are psychotropic, fancy word for they change your brain, they change the way you think. And those two hormones are estrogen and testosterone. Now, as everybody knows, women have estrogen and testosterone and men have estrogen and testosterone. So we both have both, but what I wanna to do today in the interest of time is to focus on women for the estrogen and men for the testosterone. So let's look at the bio part first of bio psycho social for estrogen. So ladies, the first thing that I have to say is 
with regard to traditional medicine, you are not a 75 kilogram male. I actually left out a word in there. You're not a 75 kilogram white male, right? Because the way that the normal values were established in the before time was based off of the baseline of a 75 kilogram white male. If you're not 75 kilograms, you've got a problem. If you're not a male, you've got a problem. If you're not white, you've got a problem. If you're not an adult, you've got a problem because medicine tended to look at children as little adults. And anybody who's given their kid too much cough syrup or given their kids some prescribed medicine from the doctor and noticed that the kid acted in exactly the opposite way that they were supposed to act when you gave them the medicine, knows that a kid's not just a little adult. With regard to women, you were seen as a 75 kilogram white male who happened to have some pesky hormones. And the body just doesn't work like that, right? This is, this is, uh, this is what drives this idea when you come from your doctor and you say, well, I know you told me my blood labs were okay, but I don't feel as good as you tell me I ought to feel, Doc, right? Your blood labs look better than you feel. So what I'd like to say is, one, you have been living in your body much longer than your care provider. So you've got the right to be heard around me. You've got the right to be heard. To be heard, you've got to be credible. To be credible, you've got to be deliberate. And what do I mean? you got to know the pros and the cons of how you're living your life. You need to be able to walk in front of your healthcare provider and say, I know that I had a reaction yesterday and it had to be the new couch in the living room that had strange fabric in it because it was the only new thing that was in my life. So let's not talk about soap and let's not talk about everything else. I'm allergic to polyurethane. Can we talk about that, right? You've got to be able to provide information to your doctor, to your nurse, to your chiropractor, to your healthcare provider that lets them know that you're being very deliberate and with a well thought out plan towards your own healthcare. Let's talk about some of those pros and cons. So let's talk about the cons of estrogen first. Of course, with uh, the biopartis bone density, right? Women of a certain age, you need to make sure that you <coughs> have your bone dexa scan performed need to be careful with certain activities after a certain age. I think the median age for menopause, median, is 51 years old. Usually happens somewhere between 45 and 54. Now, there's also cancer. It turns out in 2011, the World Health Organization classified estrogen as a carcinogen. Let me say that again. They classified estrogen as a carcinogen. Why would they do that? Well, if you think about it, carcinogens cause cancer. Cancer in its most basic definition is growth of cells out of control. Estrogen in its most basic definition is a growth hormone. So you've got a growth hormone in excess, in toxic levels sometimes, flowing through that species we call female, which makes them more susceptible to all types of cancer. Next line, increasing risk with early childhood bear, early childbearing. So this idea here is that it's, it's estrogen exposure as a growth hormone that increases your risk of cancer. The longer you're exposed to estrogen, the, the, the higher your chances are of having some type of cancer. So if you have children early, you are being exposed to cancer early and that increases your risk of cancer because you've got more childbearing years between your early pregnancy and menopause than the woman who had children later. Hormone replacement therapy, jury's still out. You'll hear yays, you'll hear nays. Um, I think the biggest one 
that I remember recently was the 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 Y. I think they ended that W H I. I think they ended that back in oh my gosh, two thousand and two maybe. And and there's some other smaller studies. I think they ended that early because of some controversy, wondering whether or not women who were on estrogen, especially those who had estrogen sensitive cancer, uh, were being predisposed to cancer by taking estrogen uh, treatments. So the idea with that study is that what they didn't mention is that um, these side effects that women were, were suffering usually occurred about a decade after menopause. So what you want to do is if you're considering hormone replacement therapy, talk to your healthcare provider about where you are in your life cycle and if it's a good idea for you. Perimenopause. Yeah, right. Hot flashes, cramps, sleep disturbance. Um, it just cannot be fun to go through. And um, I won't go into the details uh, of these except to say that I remember while I was doing the research for today's talk, I saw um, several sites that mentioned 34 symptoms of menopause, 34 symptoms of menopause. I, that is, yeah. Yeah. Women, if you're out there, you, you're a much better than a much better woman than I could ever be. I just 34 symptoms. That's wow. So let's look at psycho. So for psychotropic, as we know, like I said, estrogen is psychotropic. So it causes mood swings, uh, mental illness, perimenopause, anxiety, depression, irritability, uh, nothing new for anybody in the sound of my voice. Let's talk about some more estrogen cons. Social, we'll talk about the social consequences and the social determinants. So incontinence, vaginal dryness, height loss, memory loss, weight gain. I mean, look, you lose everything and the only thing you get to gain is weight. It's just not fair, right? That is a lot to have to go through. Social determinants, uh, lower education level. Right, so it turns out that um, women, menopausal women who have a lower education level have a much more difficult time with menopause and they have access to less or fewer resources. So uh, they don't have all of the information that they otherwise would to decrease the symptomatology of it um, and, and, to, and to have different alternative ways of treating the signs and the symptoms. Singlehood. So single women uh, tend to have uh, menopause at different times than married women. Because the idea is um, if you're married, you're probably going to have children earlier. And if you're single, you're probably going to have children later. And the later you have them and the more you have, the later your menopause is going to be. Unemployment, low social status, early marriage, all of those are kind of intertwined together, right? Um, the, the assumption seems to always be that to be married means you're in a more stable environment, you have family around you, and you're able to go through menopause in a much more uh, favorable fashion. Pros, estrogen, they were really hard to find, right? Social, that's it, I'm sorry, social. I couldn't find bio and I couldn't find psycho. So here's the really great thing, women. You can do something that we cannot as men. You can recreate your mate in your womb. I'm assuming you love them that much to do so, but you recreate that loved one in your womb, not something the male of the species can do. Let's talk about it for a moment. Here's your mom, right? Your mom and every other woman was born with about 1 million eggs. That's 6 million when she was an embryo, by the time she came out of the womb, she was born with all the eggs she'll ever have. It's about a million. If you want to feel important, when you came out, what we're saying is you are literally one in a million. Literally. Out of all those eggs, all those unfertilized eggs that were sitting there in your mom's womb, if you're hearing me now, you were the one in a million that got fertilized. 
How special does that make you feel? Let's keep going. Your baby? Once you got pregnant, you also gave birth to a baby that had one million eggs inside of her. Okay? Now, why is this important? Because if you look up at the top here, right, your mom gave birth to you. You had a million when you came out. Inside of you were already a million. One of them is going to be your baby. But what we just said is your mom had and affected two generations of eggs, right? You inside her and your baby inside you. Two generations, right? Anybody ever heard of generational strongholds? It's a real thing. So with regard to more estrogen pros, I already mentioned you can recreate the loved one in your womb. Multitasking. All right, now we get to get down to like the psychosocial stuff. So multitasking, what do I mean? July 4th, it's right around the corner. When July 4th gets here, you're gonna see a scene played out that's played out many times in this country. Um, when we're getting ready for a dinner or a barbecue or whatever, if my wife sends me to the store, I'm going to go into Shaw's or Tom Thumb or CVS or whatever it is. I already know what aisle I'm going to. It's going to be aisle number seven. I'm going to get the barbecue briskets. And I'm going to go over to aisle number three. and I'm going to get the barbecue sauce. And I'm going to go over to aisle number one. I'm going to get the buns. I'm in. I'm out. I'm not even going to go through the cashier. I'm going to use the self-pay machine there. I'm in. I'm out in nine minutes flat because I'm a man. And I say I'm efficient. And I'm in and out. No time to mess around. If my wife goes, she'll go in and she'll get the same barbecue briskets. She'll go and she'll get the same buns and she'll get everything the same. But while she's there, she'll probably check out some socks for our son. She'll probably remember that we need some of this or some of that, some greens in the refrigerator. Now, here's the deal. We men will typically say, well, we're just... Uh, more organized and we're just more focused, et cetera. I happen to have a little bit of a different take on it. What I see is the female of the species with that stuff called estrogen is able to multitask, has such an organic way of thinking that she's handling this over here and she's handling that over there. We are a lot more narrow-minded. We, we, we are built more to blow stuff up and kill things, right? So what I'm suggesting, women, is that you appreciate your ability to multitask, right? Don't accept this idea that it's being scatterbrained or unfocused. You're just multitasking and that's your superpower from estrogen. Next thing, insight into the male psyche. All right, a little biology lesson here. As everybody knows, if, if you're a female, you got two X chromosomes. If you're a male, you only have one. You got that Y hanging over there, right? Well, men, buckle up, get ready, because it's time to tell you that at some point in the womb, we were all female. We were all female. We all started out with two Xs. And at some point, if you came out of that womb as a male, you got a Y. But let me say that differently. To become a male, you had to actually turn off your female parts, right? The male parts were not going to grow. You had to turn off your female, and many parts you already had, right? You had a clitoris, but because of testosterone, it was elongated into a penis, right? You, you had a labia majora, but because of testosterone, both lips were sealed and became a scrotum. And God threw in a prostate for fruit. But we started out as females, <laughs> right? So what does this mean psychologically? Women, it means you live inside our heads rent-free, right? 
you, we, we are mostly you. 98% of the DNA is the same for us. Oh, wait a minute. And I think what I just said was that Y chromosome only makes up about 2% of the difference for us being different from you. We are mostly X chromosome stuff. Yeah, sure. The height gene is on the Y chromosome and muscles and you got more testosterone. Okay, sure. But still at the end of the day, we're more like you than not. That means you have an insight. You have a psychological understanding into how we work. And I think that's great for relationships, right? By the way, as proof that we're all alike, well, 98%, women, we love to be cradled in your arms too. Just when there's nobody looking. So let's take a look at the next slide here. If you want proof, there you go. Need I say any more? X chromosome on the left, Y chromosome on the right. There's a theory out there that in 100,000 years or so, that women won't need men anymore. And all of the genes that are on the Y chromosome, right, they will have translated over to the X and will just be unnecessary. If that happens, I'll already be gone. I'm going to leave that to the grandson of my grandson. All right, let's talk about men, testosterone. Let's do the cons. So, testosterone, right? That stuff that makes you a man. Um, the moment you move in with a woman, it decreases. The moment you start co-sleeping after you move in, it decreases. The moment you marry, it decreases. If she's pregnant, when the child is delivered and arrives in the household, it decreases. The first time you hold a baby and every other time after that, by the way, it decreases. What's the it? I, I didn't mention, right? We, we, we call it T and, and our, our male ego is kind of fragile, right? So I, I love these, commer these commercials that say, uh, and they won't talk about testosterone. You got low T and, and we talk about it in such a, a manly way. Like everything in the, in the language of even biology is, you know, the, the sperm, it, it leaves the man and it, fights its way upstream and it's battling all of these enzymes and acidic environments. And finally, you know, it conquers one egg. I think it might be better explained the other way around, right? Because it's the woman who decides which sperm gets there. So um, what you're seeing here on the screen is my recognition that really, guys, pretty much no matter what you do, you're going to have lower T once you start getting into a relationship. Why? Because my father used to have a saying. He's a Baptist preacher in Texas. And he says, boy, whatever you do to get a girl, you got to keep doing that to keep her. I think he might have been wrong here because the best Casanova does not the best husband make, right? It's one thing to chase the girl we love the hunt but after the hunt is over somehow nature has figured out that we've got to learn to be a little bit more gentle we don't need to be so aggressive we don't need to be so assertive so with all of these different changes our t goes lower here's a good one it goes lower with the need cries of a baby so when you hear your child cry and you perceive that that cry is because of a need, because of a lack, your testosterone drops lower so that you can go into a nurturing mode. How amazing is that? Let's talk about the pros. There's really only three. How do you increase your testosterone? Mating, as I mentioned earlier, that's the hunt. That's pretty much it, right? After you capture what you're chasing, it's all downhill from there. Um, it increases with the danger cries of a baby. Now, the danger cries are different from 
the need cries. If you hear your baby crying because you think somebody is stealing it, your testosterone actually goes up then. Now you're going into your fight or flight and defend my family mode, and you need to increase your testosterone. An interesting thing is sometimes if when you hear the baby crying a need cry, and there's a pathological, a broken response, and your testosterone goes up instead of down, that's when bad things happen, right? That's when you hear the stories of abuse. That's when you hear the stories of shaken baby syndrome. That's when you hear the stories of, uh, I don't know, he was crying all night and I just snapped because the testosterone went up because of anxiety and it could be the man or the woman went more into the fight or flight mode than the protective mode. And this is just the uh, paper from uh, Harvard Medical School on the holding babies, lowers testosterone and marriage. So let's talk about how we cope. We just talked about testosterone and estrogen. We started out mentioning that they were psychoactive substances. And we also mentioned that both of them in an imbalance can cause anxiety. So let's talk about how to cope and how to not cope with hormone related anxiety. Sugar, right? Everybody does it. You stress eat. And turns out that sugar feeds cancer. Let me say that again. Sugar feeds cancer. Cancer is smart at the risk of, of, of uh, talking about it like it has a mind and a purpose. Cancer is smart. It knows that we like sugar and need energy, so it feeds on it. It also knows that we can't live without vitamin D, so cancer cells develop vitamin D receptors on them because they're just going to go along for the ride. Well, with regard to sugar, just remember, if you're going to use sugar to cope with anxiety, it feeds all types of cancer. What you're looking at here is breast cancer. Sugar and trans fat, we don't really have many problems with trans fat now because of the regulations, FDA, but they both lead to coronary artery disease and stroke. Sugar leads to diabetes. And I always love talking about diabetes deeper, right? But the, 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 the idea with diabetes is 100% of the, the signs and the symptoms that are happening have a, have a, they have a primary root cause of the sugar, right? I need to change my glasses every five years. Um, um, you know, my, uh, my kidneys, my proximal tubules in my kidneys are not keeping in my water. So I'm urinating all the time. Uh, it, all of the things that you can go over with signs and symptoms of diabetes are caused by the sugar. Maybe it's two or three degrees of separation by the time the pathology, the broken stuff happens, but it starts with the sugar. We, saw, we said sugar led to diabetes. This is a paper that we published about diabetes leading to Alzheimer's. And as you, most of you have probably heard, Alzheimer's being called diabetes type three. There's another paper talking about successful diet, right? Using the so-called keto diet, the low carb diet. Um, and with the keto diet, you figure out what your numbers are. You figure out how many carbs per day and how many minutes of exercise uh, that, you, that you're going to have. And, and you just stick to a plan. And this lady who had already failed two stomach procedures, uh, was able to lose three digits of pounds uh, during the time. Now, she was, she was only on 25 grams per day, okay? I should say, I'm talking from experience. One year ago today, I weighed 43 pounds more than I do this moment. And I put myself on the same low-carb diet as we put our patient on. Um, that said, no diet works for everybody, right? Her body, my body, maybe your body speaks in the language of carbs. Some people like to think calories. Uh, some people like to think uh, grams of sugar. Uh, you have to figure out what works for your brain and what works for your body. 
The idea is be deliberate about it, though. Here's another way to cope with um, anxiety, nicotine. Nicotine is amazing. If somebody, if somebody sat back and tried to think of the most evil drug, it would be nicotine because it has what I call a quadruple whammy. It's, it's dose dependent, right? It depends on how much of it you get as to what it does. If you take short puffs in the morning before you go to work, it stimulates you, wakes you up, gets you ready for that boss. But if you go out at lunchtime after the boss has stressed you out and take a long draw, it relaxes you and calms you down. The same drug acts on two different parts of the brain. Wait a minute, they act on two different other parts of the brain. It turns out that nicotine goes to that part of the brain that normally says, you know what? You bought enough cigarettes this month. You've got to pay rent. Stop smoking. Nicotine deactivates the brain stop switch and turns up the pleasure center. It's a fourfold whammy. I mean, that is, that's some amazing stuff, right? Uh, let's talk about something else with smoke, neuropsychiatric effects of marijuana. Um, so, you know, it's a thing that we have to deal with because all the states are, seem to be moving towards regulating marijuana. It turns out that marijuana binds in the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead. And that area is responsible for self-regulation, right? How I control my impulses, anger, aggression. How much emotion am I going to let come into any judgment call that I make? This is all your prefrontal cortex. Here's the problem. It doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't mature until you're 25 years old, okay? Doesn't mature until you're 25 years old. And the rest of your brain doesn't even mature until you're 30 years old. Uh, we did a paper on a gentleman whose his nickname was called Baby Magic, um, lived in Texas, uh, lived in a very affluent community. He was an African-American, one of only three families in an affluent non-African-American community, uh, 23 years old, and um, decided to take the sheriff's daughter as a girlfriend. Got caught uh, climbing into her window and uh, made it out. Well, he got caught and then he goes to jail, but he doesn't back off. And he's driving through the neighborhood one day and the police stop him. He's two blocks away from home. Uh, they ask for his license. He gives them his license. And then when they go back to the police car, he starts running. Where does he run? Home. Where do they follow him to? Home, right? He'd been smoking marijuana for a whole decade. He said he started around 13. He did not have the ability to make a judgment call. He did not have the ability to think about the consequences of his actions. And he actually thought he could just run away from the car and run home and nothing would happen. Right. So these are these are some examples of what happens when you engage marijuana too early. So this is not me being on a soapbox saying don't smoke marijuana. The law is the law. I'm saying if your patients or your family members decide they want to, Tell them not to do it until they're 25. That's at least the responsible thing to do. Okay. Um, you can also cope with anxiety by doing something really active. This woman looks like she's having fun, right? There was a great study at Harvard Medical School. Um, it must have been 2001 about something called the VMAT2 gene. And based on this gene, however, however many copies of the gene I have is how many drops of dopamine come out and hit my brain, the pleasure drug, whenever I do something fun. So if you got 10 copies and I've got one copy and you take me bungee jumping, when I jump on the way down, I'm going, oh my God, I don't believe Dr. Maxi talked me into this. But Dr. Maxi is on the way down looking like this girl here and he is yippee ki -yay and having fun because he's got 10 drops of dopamine hitting his brain because he's got 10 copies of that VMAT2 gene. VMAT2 gene, that's also what determines, oh, I'm listening to my favorite song and the hairs on the back of my neck are coming up. Oh, chocolate, I love it. Chocolate makes everything all better. So it also controls addiction, right? If you've got too many, you can get addicted to anything. If you've got too few, it predisposes you to depression. Wouldn't be a bad idea to drop by a laboratory, see how many copies you have. Something else you can do is take psychotropic drugs, pharmaceuticals, prescribed drugs, realized every single solitary, I'm going to say two, you can't always say always in medicine. So 
whenever you can, you should always say always. Every single solitary psych psychotropic drug in medicine has the effect of dysregulating your heat. You become predisposed to heat stroke, especially in the summer, heat exhaustion. Mm. Every single solitary drug in medicine has a side effect. They all have side effects. It's just that some of the side effects we call therapeutic and then the others we call adverse. But the drug itself is exogenous. It comes out from the outside of the body. It, the drug itself is a side effect. So you have to be careful with pharmaceuticals that you don't end up suffering from more side effects than whatever you're taking it for. There is a reason that most psychiatric medications have that little black box warning. Here's another way to treat. There's pharmaceuticals, there's nutraceuticals, right? Also known as supplements, B12, that kind of thing. There's also electroceuticals. Electroceuticals include things like what you see on the screen, transcranial magnetic stimulation. You basically put on a little swim cap. It's got some magnetic electrodes. They turn on the machine. You feel some tapping on your forehead. And the magnetism speaks to the neurons and causes the neurons to depolarize at the frequency they were born to work. It's different from electroconvulsive therapy. Remember Paul Robeson? right? And electroconvulsive therapy took him to Russia. Uh, remember the 60s, everybody said the man is shocking your brain. This is not that. That was electricity. The whole point was to make you seize. It was kind of like kicking the television to try to get your brain, your brain back into sync. This is magnetism talking to an electron. It's not jump-starting the battery. It's just letting the electron operate at the level of, of um, frequency that it was meant to. Now, um, the reason I believe this has a lot, a lot of advantage over pharmaceutical, um, Yi Jin, Shanghai, China, MD, PhD, in 2008, he's the creator of transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. He went head to head with four, four antidepressants, and they were more effective, more efficacious, the TMS was more efficacious than the four antidepressants. And it had a lower side effect profile, which of course is the potential for seizure. Right? So what are the side effects? Headache, because you feel tapping on your head. And um, I've probably been working with it for years now. I mean, three years. And I haven't seen a adverse effect yet, other than headaches. And as we wind down, prayer and meditation is another way to deal with anxiety. Uh, there's spec scans. There's Andrew Newberg. Andrew Newberg was in my congregation when I lived in Philadelphia. He's an MD, PhD, double boarded in radiology and cardiology, I believe. He wrote a book called Why Won't God Go Away? And what he did is took brain scans. Well, let me say this. He writes a lot of books on if you're going to have a supernatural God act on a natural body, that supernatural God has got to act with a natural mechanism of action, right? If I am blind and now I see, he's got to fix my retina. He's got to fix my lens. He's got to fix, right? It's, it's got to be a, a physical natural physiological mechanism of action that's being acted through. And with, and this, this is what Newberg writes about, where you see on the screen on the left is baseline and on the right, it's, it's meditation. And uh, what you're looking at is more blood flow to these areas, okay? Now, what I want you to do is pay attention to this right here. See, on the baseline right there, you don't have blood flow. Meditation, I've got blood flow. But you see this connection here? When you started meditating, there's less blood flow and it was more present over here, okay? All right. In the two minutes I have left, um, I'm gonna explain this experiment. So Andrew Newberg, 
takes a monk inside of his laboratory. He says, sit down. I want you to meditate. While you meditate, I want you to, I'm going to tie this, this, thing, this uh, string to your finger. I'll be outside and we have a needle going into your arm. And when you get to that piece of peace, when you get to that highest level of meditation, when you get to your nirvana, your heaven, whatever you want to call it, what I want you to do is wiggle your finger. What I'm going to do is inject that dye into your arm, goes to your brain and click. We will take a picture of God, what you're experiencing at that moment. So this is what he ha- this is what happens. Now, pause. That little dot up there I was showing you, it's called the association area. It's in a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, ACC, association area. What that means is your association area, it, excuse me, it tells you where you are with regard to the universe, right? You don't have to measure yourself when you slide up to a kitchen table or your dining room table. You kind of know how far. When you get in line at the grocery store, you know what the parapersonal and the personal uh, distance is. You don't have to measure it. We all have this sense of where our bodies stop and the rest of the universe begins. That is what the association area does. Press the play button. Go back to that monk. So Newberg says to the monk, tell me what you thought, what you felt when you hit nirvana. He says, I felt like I was a part of everything and then everything was a part of me. I felt like I was one with God and the universe. We were all one being. It's the closest I've ever been to God. Newberg said, well, that's interesting because what I saw on the screen is your association area lost some blood flow. In other words, when you started meditating, that association area was no longer able to do its job. You lost the ability to tell where you ended and the rest of the universe began. You were using words like, I felt like I was a part of everything and everything was a part of me. I felt like I was at one with God, but this was the physiological manifestation of whatever you were thinking. Why am I telling you all that today? Because at the end of the day, when you're trying to figure out how to handle anxiety, it doesn't matter if God exists. It doesn't matter if Buddha exists. It doesn't matter if Allah exists. What matters is do you believe it? The rest is between you and your God on the other side of your last breath. But do you believe it? That's how you make it from one day to the other. That is the scientific proof. Thank you. Wow. Reverend Doctor, I'll give you a triple amen. Thank you so much for that <laughs> interesting talk. Uh, Thank you, sir. We've got a short while left. And uh, Dr. Walks, why don't we let you comment and question first, and then Dr. Uh, Neighbor Stevens and Dr. Hines and myself. Well, well first of all, uh, I'm, I, I have to take a minute to recover. That was a lot. Uh, <laughs> as a as a as a as a fellow former member of the armed services, thank you for your for your service. As a fellow uh, pastor's child, um, my deepest uh, uh, sympathies. <laughs> and, and, uh, thank you for thanking me. <laughs> and, and 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 let me say let me say that it is I like. One of the comments I'll make, Dr. Matthew, thank you for letting me comment, is I like the correlation between what we believe is answered prayer and something happening in our body. Because the more that we can that we can do that, I've as I've I've been a physician a long time and I've seen many things that that um, other doctors uh, can't explain. And I'm very comfortable with uh, with uh, explaining it through answered prayer. And at the same time, I, I I do feel that we have these bodies and that we are given these bodies um, divinely. And I think that that God is able to reach in and interact and and touch and change and move. But I think that that's how it happens. I think there is some touching and changing and moving that happens. So I really appreciated that particular. Um, area of, of of focus for you. The part I didn't appreciate is the whole part about men not being necessary and women just taking over everything. I, I, <laughs> but 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 I think the more we understand about 
the differences and the more we understand about the opportunities to be more understanding. Um, I think that is that is fabulous. We we get so stuck on what makes us different and why that difference is so important. And um, I, I think it's I think it's it's absolutely precious to understand that the testosterone decreases when you need it less. We just need the women to understand that that we don't have to be so tough once they marry us. It's okay for us to soften up a little bit. If we <laughs> if we can, if we can get them to stop asking for a rough neck once we settle in and get married, I think that'll that'll help the men a lot. So I'll stop there with my with my comments. Just just thank you so much. I think this is this is a real um, useful way to share that information so that it is accessible and folks can actually take it and do something with it. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Well, I too want to thank you for a masterful session. It certainly opens up many, many avenues of thought. But what I want to comment on has to do, is related to uh, several conversations my husband and I have been having lately around, no, it's not, I'm not going where you think, uh, <laughs> uh, about um, why Blacks attack Blacks and why we have such high levels of Black-on-Black -black crime. And we we are, we, we spend a lot of time in Memphis and so and I am a Memphian, so all of that is playing into it. But also, it's not getting any better. And so far, nothing that anybody has tried seems to be working. And being a pediatrician, I was particularly intrigued by your opening remarks around the effect of trauma on children. So we, you, we're not going to be able to really talk about this today, but it certainly is opening up a train of thought that I hope sometime soon we can explore because I do think we need to have a lot more conversation about why are we killing ourselves. Thank you. Amen. Dr. Hines, are you on? I am. And same, I uh, thank you for this and talk. I, I have so many questions. Um, of things that I want to know more about. But actually, I'm going to concede my few moments to uh, Dr. Sherrod and Dr. Gibson because you hear from me all the time. So I want to make sure that they get a chance to say, to speak. Go ahead, Dr. Gibson, and then Dr. Sherrod. Are they unmuted? I was just. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sherrod is unmuted. Go ahead, Dr. Sherrod. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, first, uh, I, I agree with all of the other speakers. That was such an erudite lecture. And, and I have many questions. And one is concerning uh, the X chromosome. Um, you know, I went to a lecture and I can't really remember exactly. It was a Harvard professor who did the lecture. But I think he said that the DNA that's transmitted during... Um, you know, birthing is it's the D. It's only the DNA from the X chromosome of the woman that's transmitted, and, and I may have it confused, but that's one question. But the other question too, and I think I know this as a fact that intelligence is carried on the X chromosome, and women actually have two, so we have a bit of an advantage there. But I really appreciate how you went through and the that's right. and the lackness. Pardon me? What are you trying to say? Uh, I'm oh, she's just saying, saying it. She's I, I'm saying just it. saying. <laughs> <laughs> but my other question is, what is the difference between TMS and neurofeedback? And I don't know if that's an unfair question to you. No. But, um, it, I would like for you to kind of just hit on that for a moment. But thank you so much for elucidating all of these important things that are sometimes overlooked in women. Oh, yes, yes. So thank you for your <laughs> kind words, Doc. Thank you. So regarding the difference in TMS and, and neurofeedback, so TMS is a type of neurofeedback. Uh, electroencephalogram is, is neurofeedback. 
um, echocardiogram and EKG, that's electricity and it's neurofeedback. So when you say neurofeedback, you're just talking about all these different ways and it's usually electrical that we read our body signals. And right now, the one that has the most promise, uh, because I didn't mention it, FDA approved it in 2008 for anxiety and depression, right? We have patients that we've treated for spider phobia, agoraphobia. Um, and, and it's because now we're able to target a particular part of the brain and you come in for five sessions in a row for two weeks and then you're done for six months. Mm. That's so much different than, okay, we're gonna prescribe you this uh, antidepressant. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Jones, the adverse effects of the antidepressant are gonna kick in immediately, but you gotta wait six weeks for the therapeutic effects to kick in, right? As opposed to this treatment modality, which hasn't had any side effects like that on record. So uh, that's my long-winded answer to a very short question. Yeah, but where is that therapy uh, located? Uh, personally, I have one center in New, New York. My wife's a New Yorker, so I had to learn how to say it. There's also one in California. Um, we plan on opening up an, another one near Inglewood, California. There's one oh, in okay. Tai, Tai no, no, Taipan. There's another one in Mexico. All of those four are directly related to Dr. Yi Jin. He and I have an agreement that all of the patients that come through, I get first right of refusal on writing papers. And so we've got, oh, and there's one in, there's one at Harvard Medical School because they act, this is so great. They actually have a, uh, um, I'm sorry, the Facebook guy, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife's name is Chang, I believe. Yeah. It's Chang gave nine figures to Harvard Medical School to do a study on, I'm gonna paraphrase the title, um, using TMS to treat post-TIA aphasia in the black community. Wow. So Dr. Um, Maxi will have all the specifics on this because I'm very much interested. I'm a TBI person. So I've actually been doing neurofeedback and all, but also I wanted to say, I know I have to cut my time, but meditation is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Yeah. It actually saved my life. And I won't oh. go any further on that. Well, Thank I want to you. talk to you more offline. I've got some learning to do from you. Dr. Gibson. Okay. Thank you. We'd love Thank to. You for... no, I'll I'm put sorry. my email in the chat. Thank you. Is that Dr. Ahead, Dr. Gibson? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to take this opportunity <clears throat> to really thank our presenter today for uh, such a complete presentation of so many different topics. Uh, I'm, I'm like Dr. Walks. I'm floored by the amount of information that you were able to convey and so <laughs> clearly. So I am going to take executive privilege here and invite you when you manage to get time to come back to us because we need more of this. Uh, as, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as a practicing uh, or retired pharmacist, um, I'm very curious about the utilization of TMS. And, and that's something that I believe has probably more promise than we're aware of at this point. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear your reaction to that position. Uh, first of all, thank you. I am honored that you even want to hear me babble twice. Um, I accept. <laughs> um, and my, my answer to, uh, to the TMS and the promise, oh, you, as we say in Texas, you and I are riding the same horse. And here's why. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I've got a million receptors in my brain. That's a receptor. And if I prescribe an antidepressant for you, it's got, I'm going to call it 2 million molecules. Okay. 1 million of those molecules are going to bind my 1 million brain receptors. What happens to that other million molecules? They just bind willy-nilly. Wait a minute, we call that adverse effects. It's binding on the heart. It's binding on the kidney. It's binding for you know, sexual uh, reproduction. It's binding in all kinds of places that it should not be binding, and we call them side effects. And that's why the side effects happen immediately. Those one million that did bind my brain receptors, it takes about six weeks for my brain 
to grow more receptors so that the extra 1 million floating around can now all be bound by the brain. That is why I think TMS is, this is the cutting edge of technological evolution with regard to the brain. And I'm just excited where it's going. Uh, there's a special person I want to recognize. Uh, one, uh, she is a speech pathologist. She has a newly earned PhD. And when I had a stroke a while back and had uh, problems talking, she helped me get my language back. Can Lauren Kawasaki be unmuted to ask you a question or make a comment? And she's very interested in this TMS, Dr. Brown. Lauren? Uh, while, we're, while we're getting her unmuted, Dr. Maxi, uh, Dr. Lisa Kerwin Dawes has her hand up. Okay. And and also uh, Tony has his hand up. So maybe we can work on uh, work on getting those three unmuted. Go ahead. Who's first? Oh, I can speak. Or I can ask a question. They're the smaller TMS machines, which I have seen. Um, how better are the professional models that the people have to come into the office all the time? And I noticed you said every six months. Um, from what I've read, the variability is usually around four months. Or are the professional machines give a lot longer time? Okay, thank you for the question. So yeah, you, you can go online and you can find the remote headsets, really 30, 40 bucks. And uh, the downside to that is those are not going to be targeted. When you go into the office, they do a brain mapping session so that they can figure out where on your scalp the particular brain anatomy is located under your skull so that they can maximize the treatment. Right. So what, what you get from the store is is not going to be calibrated that way. That's thing number one. Thing number two is that when the FDA approved TMS for depression and anxiety, they only approved it for research areas. Right. And the idea was they're like, this is cutting edge and we know it works, but you need the best of the best machinery and the best of the best people trained on it and people who drink it and breathe it. It's not quite ready for just the, you know, the, the non-scientific uh, researcher physician. It's why even in the centers that I was just talking about, these are clinical research centers who enroll patients, which enroll patients uh, both for the therapeutic part of it and the research. And um, so what you would want to do is to find somebody who's connected with a research hospital, because that's where you're going to get the best right now. And then that, that last question that you had about four months versus six months. Oh, absolutely. So what, what happens here is there's no particular protocol based on the machine, because um, what I'm talking about is alpha wave guided TMS. We look at the alpha waves in the brain. Other people might be looking at delta. Uh, the one thing that you can depend on that's going to happen, it's going to happen in the first week, is your patient is going to sleep better because it always affects the delta waves, the deep sleep waves. And then the only question is, how long will it take to affect the other waves? That really depends on what you're treating, um, uh, how much uh, um, oscillations and power and wattage and voltage you're pushing through, and whether the patient even responds, keep in mind, they might not even respond, but it's kind of like, what does that used to say about alternative medicine? It, it might not help you, but it won't hurt you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the other thing is I, I'm in Jamaica, West Indies. We do have a couple of people that do it. Um, the question is, um, how would you actually be involved in more of the cutting edge instead of what they're doing on the side for complementary medicine. Yeah, um, all you'd have to do is look up um, a research hospital. I know that Dr. Eugene, he's at Caltech right now. Um, there is another laboratory, a clinical laboratory, if you will. Nobody wants to be, you know, a lab rat, <laughs> but so I'll be yeah. the word laboratory. Uh, there, there's one at UPN in, in Philadelphia. Uh, there's one also at Harvard that I said Ms. Chang gave the money out to. 
and um, there's one at the Neuropsychiatric Center in um, uh, it's the Black Building in New York, Columbia, Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Those are the only ones I know off my head, but there's got to be more. Matter of fact, you know what? If you Google brain. Remember, uh, I'm in oh. Jamaica, West Indies. So it's a little trickier to actually work with someone out of the country on research protocols. I do work with a few and trying to make it easier. Mm. But right now, it's not as simple as that. So Dr. Dawes, Dr. Brown and I will take a flight down to see you. <laughs> yeah, no complaints there. Okay. Love but, to have you. Try to set up set up things to have things work a little easier in the process of doing that now in order get to get more other people in. Dr. Dawes. I only have a couple of other people in. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Doctor uh, Thank you. Doc, Dr. Kawasaki is 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 unmuted, Dr. Maxi. Dr. Kawasaki? Yes, Dr. Maxi. Good afternoon. Aloha. <laughs> Good. Uh, do you have a comment or a question for Dr. Brown? I do. I, um, in working with my adult aphasic patients, I'm in speech and language pathology. I use a lot of electronic stim for um, working with um, more um, function and range of motion for the oral motor musculature, as well as trying to get some of the muscles to relax and, you know, talking them through visual imagery, et cetera. But I do, I'm, I'm really interested in how we could um, collaborate and make more connections with um, physicians like yourself um, or others that are actually working in this area with um, with the stimulation, um, the TMS, because I think that if they're more relaxed, and this is one of my very um, uh, near and dear to me, my, my heart, um, when it comes to uh, stress hormone control, um, because we know that those those levels of, you know, high stress levels are, uh, affect their ability to speak um, during those episodes when they're having problems, right? Um, and then also, when they're when they're more relaxed, we can get more um, function of their swallow as well. So I'd like to see some of that um, connection. Yes, I, I love that you're thinking about it. Uh, there's a direct connection between what you're doing and TMS because with TMS you can target. You you were talking about tongue and speech muscles. You can target cranial nerves, right? And uh, what is it? Number I forget. Number five. I think that pushes the tongue out. So you can target cranial nerves with TMS. Uh, I would love to talk with you because it's just wide open. This is just like undiscovered country. Excellent. Uh, there's a, two other people. Uh, Tony on, Mr. Walford, one had his hand up. Was that true, uh, Dr. Walks? Uh, I, I don't, he's not un, unmuted on... Maybe we can take one last one, okay, Dr. Maxi. Also, oh, there. Okay, Tony's good, and then Dr. Dr. Lawson also had his hand up. Okay, and then I want to also recognize Dr. Kokai. Yeah. First, let me say, excellent presentation, brother. I really enjoyed it, and and I think it was really interesting. We talk about always studying the brain, and and again, I'm a disclaimer, no physician here, just a concerned person. And I think it's interesting how we do so much interest in studying in brains of, of, of the oppressed people and never really talk about the oppressor in terms of what's going on in his head. It's mm -hmm. just like we were talking about uh, earlier, we were, talking, we, we were talking about black on black crime. Well, I don't particularly, I think we should never say that because if you criminalize, if you, if you, if you racialize crime, then you can criminalize the race. We don't talk about white on white crime and then white people in Ukraine kill each other like 40 going north. But we don't we don't do that. And I think it's important that we once at some point, when do we study the brain of the oppressor versus the oppressed? Because, I mean, it's a, it only the only thing I see is that it's a mark. It's remarkable by, by God's grace that we've been able to endure what we as as a people and still stand. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious is what would make a person just savage another person. And when we talk about, quote unquote, crime in the community. Well, wherever there's poverty, there's crime. I don't think it has anything to do with brain, with the brain or rescue me if I'm wrong. It has a lot to do with oppression. And if, I remember I was reading a book by Fanon. Fanon, one of the greatest pathologies is the pathology of unfreedom. That's what causes us to be sick and rescue me if I'm wrong. And I'll just listen to your response. Appreciate your time. 
Well, thank you, Tony. I got three quick responses. One is, I'm so sorry you got this same name. I actually Googled <laughs> Tony Brown, and there are 14,400 of us in this country. If you call, if you count all the Antoninos, Antoine, Antonio, et cetera. And every time I come back in the country, I get stopped because a lot of them are bad actors. And my mother just says, I'm so sorry I named you Tony. So you're another <laughs> one. Sorry about that. Uh, to answer your, your, your second issue about when do we study the mind of the oppressor, six words. Uh, it's the title of a book. White is a state of mind. Uh, hmm. I think you might enjoy that book. And then with regard to TMS and EEGs, the reason hmm. I love it is because you can study anything you want. All you need to do is have willing subjects who are willing to be transparent enough to tell you what their thoughts are and put that little swim cap on your head, right? So just like you had non-Black people coming to civil rights marches, et cetera, I believe that when we start studying uh, intercultural relationships, there will be non-this and non-that raising their hand because everybody wants to know why they think what they think. Well, I want to thank everybody for their input. There's a, a promise I made. Is Dr. Kokai able to unmute? If we can unmute Dr. Kokai and Dr. Lawson, Dr. Kokai is unmuted. Greetings. Um, that was a great presentation. And I wanted to add in a couple points. Um, I wrote my thesis on physics and medicine back in 1980. So I've been looking at applied physics and just the developments and how that actually applies to the practice of medicine and understanding the reality of what a human being is. And in the biofeedback world, we've kind of gone from direct biofeedback. I had trained with Margaret Ayers here in Los Angeles many years ago. And then you have QEEG, which compares the, the EEGs of thousands of people and then designs programs to normalize that. And now you have more direct Neurofeedback, I put in a link, neurogenbb.com, that actually um, the computer does all the work. The computer senses what the imbalance is and delivers the micro signal that corrects that. Now, that has just fantastic, beyond just anxiety, depression, but really, you know, neurodegenerative disease, all kinds of problems, right? So, the piece that um, I had shared with Dr. Maxey, I'm giving a presentation at the Andrew Wiles Center on Tuesday, where I'm really talking about a more multidimensional paradigm. Because right now, we're still working within the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of understanding the effect of electricity and magnetism in the body. But beyond that is something called scalar waves, which are faster than light, it deals with just instantaneous you know, information sharing. And it's something that of course has been used to explain why people have precognition or knowing because at the scalar lay, um, level in physics, right? You don't really have a thing with time and space. It's a whole different reality. And I call it applied physics in the same way that from classical physics, we went into biochemical medic medicine from understanding energy fields, we appreciate chi and things like that. But this quantum physics and what it's bringing about in terms of applying that, it's a fantastic system. You can check out eesystem.com that's popping up all around the world. Um, this is, is at the level where you can deal with what I call a consciousness deficit disorder, which is what really plagues humanity. <laughs> You know, because unless our consciousness is at the heart level where we can see beyond the phenomenal realm and just the differences that people have, we're just going to be another story in this segment of humanity that goes into the, you know, to the dustbin. But, that's okay. Did you put your announcement in the chat for everybody? Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't post it. It says you have to do something on your end for me to post it. It says access to file restricted by your account admin. Okay, so, maybe maybe Simon can fix that because we're we're almost out of time. Yeah, I, I'm just going to put that, and then if you have chance Tuesday, um, it's a lecture through the Andrew Weil Center, multidimensional paradigm, moving from biochemistry to bio um, bioenergetics and consciousness, right? 
as a way to deal with things. So, um, and, and this brings in other paradigms, particularly within the arena of shamanic and African traditions, which I had the opportunity to travel through the continent and really dialogue with traditional healers, even do the film. Well, thank so, you so much, Dr. Cocaine. Ali, I, I, I can't put it up, so. Okay, we'll find a way to see if we can get okay. it up. Uh, Dr. Sure. Lawson, I think, had his hand up. He did. Yes, I want to thank you for an outstanding presentation, outstanding because it brings together a number of diverse fields that more of us need to be aware of. The literature in terms of the relationship between testosterone, estrogen, and number of behaviors that are studied in terms of looking at pathology in the past, we need to do more of it now in terms of the constructive way in which you discussed it. TMS, great modality. There's, I think there's 10 machines in DC, um, about uh, 20 in uh, Austin, Texas. Not one of them um, hey, were treating African-American patients. So I'm big on promoting the use of it in terms of the clinical setting. Um, of course, it should tie it to an academic center if you can. But none of the HBCUs as of right now that we can try to do something different in Howard and very near future um, has access to the machines. And there are a number of other barriers. One is trying to get um, Medicaid to pay for it and to get our insurances to pay for it, especially since there's this um, ridiculous rule that you have to fail antidepressants yes. before you can use it, when in fact it is fewer side effects than most of the antidepressants. So I would welcome any suggestions you have to be able to make sure that we get these effective modalities available to African Americans. Thank you. So if I, like I could that. take, if I could, can I respond for in 15 seconds, Doc? Yes. Okay, so uh, to Dr. Lawson, you're, exact, you're exactly right, because the idea was that Yi Jin wanted for this to be an adjunct treatment. He didn't want you to stop your drugs. He wants to add on to it. And then for Dr. Kokan, I'm going to front load our conversation with, can you think about, with regard to your topic, can you think about third theory of thermodynamics, right? Everything in the universe trending toward entropy, trending toward disorder, how that works in consciousness. I'm trying to train an AI model on it now. And secondly, can you also think about how I would get rid of all the waves, right? The alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. And I only want to look at background waves, aperiodic waves that have no rhythm. And I want to find correlations for that in mental health care. I'm trying to train a model on it now. There we go. I'm done. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. So I'd like our, uh, in the interest of time, and first of all, I want to give thanks and praise to Dr. Brown for this wonderful, wonderful talk. And uh, we're thank going you. to be seeing him again soon. And Dr. Lawson and I are going to be talking with him uh, shortly. That's very good. Uh, Dr. Hines, do you have final comments? Yes. So what I will say is I have a whole list of questions in addition to TMS. One of the things that came out of this discussion for me is, and when you do come back, uh, hopefully you can include a part for how can we make sure that our patients and ourselves are with reputable people or with reputable mm. providers for these types of things. Because mm. what I also heard is there's a lot of dabbling, right? And you may, and you may not necessarily know who you're with. Um, yeah. The other things that I hopefully we could talk about again is like the dopamine receptors and that role in in addiction as in because I kind of heard you say that maybe you could check on that and see if you might have some predispositions in that area. Yes, that's you know wow. And then uh, yes, yeah. So there, there are so many things I hope to hear from hear more about. And and lastly, I will also add we were talking about SDOH and brain and how that changes your brain probably on a functional level and maybe in an anatomical like would love that is the buzzword that we've all known for you know 20 years right but that like cms and stuff like that are just now figuring out that we've been talking about something pertinent um too many lots of lots so thank you lots and lots, lots of questions of things that uh would love to hear more on dr. I love learning out anytime with you thanks doc dr walks uh reverend dr brown just really appreciate the comprehensiveness of how you are looking at things that can make our lives work better. Um, so many of us are, and, and I, this is a much longer conversation, but you mentioned the world in which we live and how that impacts how we think, how we experience our 
experience in this world. It is it is very, very challenging to try to pull out one little thing and say, well, we're going to treat this and treat that. It's hard to hard to get your anxiety to go away when you live in a place where you hear gunshots all the time. So I I, I just appreciate the comprehensiveness of this. And, and I really like Dr. Hines. I'm looking forward to more conversation because I think this is how we take our doctor stuff and make it work in the community for uh, regular folks, if that's even a term we can use, who are you know just trying to live their lives. They're just trying to live their lives, and it's hard out there. It's really, really challenging. Thank you, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. I too am thoroughly um, overwhelmed by the content, and look forward to seeing more conversation, especially as it relates to how this understanding, evolving understanding may be translated into uh, better understanding of child development and emotional development and yeah. how we can improve the lives of our children. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Brown, one of the things that I asked you when we first talked about you speaking was you agreed not only to talk to our audience on Sundays, but you agreed to give us a seminar to our Wednesday meetings that we have for our advisory. So I'd like to arrange that soon, but thanks everybody for spending their afternoon with us. We're way over time. I know Dr. Neighbor Stevens is not gonna let me eat any meatloaf now, uh, but I thank everybody for joining us today. And do we have a, a program for next week's schedule, uh, Dr. Neighbor Stevens? Not at this time. Okay. Well, thank everybody. Have a great Sunday afternoon. And thank you again, uh, Reverend Dr. Tony Brown. Thank you, sir. See everyone next week. And thanks, Simon.